Hey everyone, this is Ben Norton and this is Moderate Rebels. This is part of a live stream discussion that I held with my co-host Max Blumenthal and our colleague at the Gray Zone, Aaron Mate. We were talking about regime changers in Western academia. These, ac these rad lib academics, radical liberals, who pretend like they're, they have such revolutionary radical politics, they use language of decolonization, well, they end up supporting imperialism. They're just liberal imperialists, and, and they use woke language about gender identity and identity politics while they're actively supporting racist military coups, far-right regimes backed by the United States installed in places like Bolivia, and reactionary candidates in countries like Ecuador. It's, it's a pretty interesting conversation. If you want to hear the rest of our conversation where we talk about the hawkish foreign policy of the Biden administration or the new Cold War on China or the brutal U.S. sanctions on Syria, definitely check out the other parts of this conversation. But without further ado, here is one part of our live stream discussion with Aaron Mate. You know, listen, since we're making fun of of, uh, of different uh, liberal groups, uh, liberal homophobes, liberal uh, Russophobes, since we, make, since we mentioned Ecuador, Ben, should we talk about the academics who attacked you uh, for calling out the fake eco-socialist Ecuadorian candidate and, how, and now he is, or his VP is now backing the right-wing candidate? Yeah, I mean, I can briefly address it. I mean, we're, we're going to cover this more. The election, the second round of the election is coming up this upcoming week in Ecuador. So we'll, we'll come back to this story. So I'm not going to spend too much time, but just this is actually a good segue because this has been the latest in a series of very angry open letters attacking us because that's all of these toothless <laughs> academics. They, like, they, they can't refute anything that we report because it's factual. So they, re they resort to these ridiculous smear campaigns. And because they're academics, the first thing they think is like, oh, what can we do? Oh, let's do an open letter. And we'll do an open letter calling for us to be deplatformed or whatever. And the, one of the latest is that a series of academics, including many of them who actually supported the very far right military coup in Bolivia in 2019, published this open letter. And this is not a joke. Smearing me and the gray zone as an extension as racist and sexist anti-semitic and anti-semitic <laughs> because we criticized this fake left-wing candidate yaku perez and as you can see here on the screen the, this this guy with the leather jacket um he's standing next to the u.s ambassador to ecuador who's his close friend and you can see him holding like the u.s flag. having a nice laugh having a nice chuckle yeah <laughs> and so uh, I, I i did this these reports just showing how Yaku Perez, this fake left candidate, has supported numerous right-wing coups across Latin America. He was also asked in a debate, uh, the, leading, the leading candidate in the Ecuadorian election who won the first round of the election in February in a landslide is a socialist named Andres Arauz. And he follows in the footsteps of the former president, Rafael Correa, and his movement, it's called the Citizens' Revolution. And Andres Arauz has, has proposed a lot of very ambitious socialist policies, including one of the first things that he said he wanted to do is give $1,000 checks to 1 million poor and working class families in Ecuador, which is a lot of money in Latin America, $1,000. In, in the context of the U.S., that would be like several thousand dollars adjusted for. That would be the, like the actual Biden stimulus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and w so Yaku Perez was asked in this interview if he supported that policy. And he said no, because if you give poor people all that money, they'll just buy, spend it all on beer in one night. So this guy is a total fake left candidate. And, but anyway, so his wife, you can see in these photos, is also a very prominent Brazilian French academic who has a lot of links to Western regime change institutions. She teaches in the United States. I showed in my reporting also how she as a very high profile critic of the left wing Correa, the Correa government, she intentionally violated the law doing civil disobedience to get herself deported because she was on a tourist visa and you can't violate the law and participate in civil disobedience on a tourist visa. So then she got herself deported and turned herself into this martyr and the European Union testified in her behalf. She started getting all these grants from these Western government funded fake human rights organizations, including an organization that's, that was created by the European Commission 
as an arm of its soft power. And anyway, so I mean, it's it's a it's a clearly bogus operation. But then a bunch of these coup supporting academics published this ridiculous open letter, not challenging a single fact that I reported, of course, because they never, they never do, that. do. They never Instead do. Instead of smearing me as sexist and racist. And I have to say the, the irony of this is that right after a few days after this, this dumb open letter came out, Yaku Perez went on Facebook and he basically called for another coup, but this time he called for a coup inside Ecuador. He called for the military to intervene in the election to nullify the first round of the results that he lost and to do a, a whole new election that would disqualify the leftist candidate, Andres Arau. So this is the coup plotting candidate that the all these Western liberal academics threw their weight around. And I'll just add one other funny detail about this. One of the people who signed this letter is this, is this critical theorist and gender theorist, Judith Butler. She signed the original letter smearing us as racist and sexist. And when I, when I emailed her with a request for comment saying, uh, you know, this guy you were defending, Yaku Perez, just called for a military coup and nullifying the election results. Um, can you, do, do you still support him? And immediately, Judith Butler threw him under the bus and said, yeah. this is an exact quote, please know that I do not support the coup or the current president. My concern was only to defend ecofeminism as I know it the important right. work on indigenous cultures and languages. I have been dismayed to learn that my signing of the document translates into support for Yaku Perez. I do not support Yaku Perez and never have. If you read the letter, it says explicitly that we as supporters of Yaku Perez and the movement he represents. So, I mean, it shows that at the same time, I think a lot of these academics barely even read the open letter that they're signing because it's not about what it actually keep says. that in mind it's for about, later everybody keep that yeah, observation it, in mind for later that well, will come it's up about again. being in the club and <laughs> smearing the people who are seen as toxic like us yeah it's about getting your name out there and yeah totally signaling sig it's virtue signaling but signaling your worthiness to the people who are getting ahead and we don't come from academia um but yeah she didn't read the letter i actually corresponded with judith who i i, I wasn't like friendly with her, but I'd been in touch with her before because she was a supporter of, I thought she was a supporter of Palestine and BDS. I mean, I was kind of dismayed to see her donating money to Kamala Harris, who's like the one of the most pro-Israel candidates in history. But uh, nevertheless, I said, you know, you signed a letter that called my colleague an anti-Semite and a sexist and a racist. Uh, did you read the letter? And she said, I think that I was like too hasty. So there you have it. Um, and, you know, no one else is really going to be held to account because of this hermetic academic world they live in where you actually gain momentum in your career by denouncing the evil gray zone. I mean, I saw some NACLA editor, some editor from this academic, what used to be a left-wing academic publication, NACLA, um, attacking us for our coverage of Bolivia. That she, she was like saying what were like performative or something and like, what no, no, no. she's one of those people who says that it wasn't a coup. I mean, the, these yeah. fake leftists who say but it she, wasn't a coup and that Evo Morales was a dictator and that the social movements of Bolivia, for some reason, opposed Evo Morales, even though the MAS party has won the last two elections in a massive landslide. I mean, this is her. The, and the best yeah. part about her tweet is she didn't even write. She was afraid of writing gray zone. So she put like, yeah. like you would write like a cuss word or something. She put like the asterisks. Yeah. I thought oh, was, but listen, Ben, go to Rapala. I thought you were talking about the, the grizzle yard or something. <laughs> I didn't know it was the gray zone until someone pointed or, it out. Or Godzilla. Or Godzilla. Godzilla. Uh, yeah. Ben, go to her follow-up tweets because they're so funny. So she says well, she nothing. She blocked me. Oh, okay. Yeah, she blocked me too. As soon as I, I mean, so. But anyway, what's yeah, so funny about her tweets is she's like, she's like, okay, yeah, I'm just getting started. I could go, I could say so much more. Believe me, trust me. But she's saying nothing. She offers like no criticism whatsoever, but she's doing the thread like, yeah, oh, it gets worse, trust me. Oh, you think gray zone's good? No, trust me, they're bad. It gets worse, let me tell you what they did. They went to El Alto and they interviewed survivors of the Senkata massacre <laughs> carried out by a right-wing US-backed coup regime that mowed down indigenous protesters in the streets. And they went there and talked to them and gave them voice. And that at a time when the interior minister of Bolivia was threatening them with deportation, that was so performative and wrong. Like, how dare they? That's like 
It's like, what did we do wrong? Like in Bolivia, like I get their, their, their whole phony thing of authoritarianism in Venezuela or whatever, like Venezuela has been so thoroughly demonized in media, but to be attacked by a NACLA editor for opposing the coup in Bolivia is just, it just speaks to the complete intellectual and moral bankruptcy of all of these climbers in academia who say they're like, we're fighting neoliberalism and we're eco-socialists. And then here you have like the, the candidate that if, if they were like all voters in Ecuador, he would win in a landslide. He is them. He married one of them. Like his wife is this e fake eco-socialist, former Jeb Bush staffer, Manuela Peak. And we're talking about Yaku Perez, the kind of third place spoiler candidate in Ecuador. His wife was a staffer for Jeb Bush, you know, he was, she was helping to negotiate the free trade area of the Americas, which was one of the worst assaults on Latin American workers in recent history. And, and which now, led to the creation of the Bolivarian Trade Alliance, the ALBA. Right. It was because it was called the, the ACLA, which was the U.S. trade deal. So then they made the ALBA. Right, exactly. And and then there's this fraud, Yaku Perez. I mean, this guy is such a fraud. Like his, he used to campaign, like he has like a ponytail and he rides a bicycle and tries to look like this indigenous hipster, but he used to campaign as Carlos Perez with like a clean shave and glasses. And he had like just nor like a normal haircut. He looked like a generic Latin American candidate. Uh, and then all of a sudden he changes it. It's like he had a midlife crisis, like things weren't going well for him and he changes his look to like meet like hipster women or something. I don't know what he was trying to do, but this is like the figure that they're getting behind. And it's so obvious what his agenda is. His agenda is to split the left, to paint uh, the socialist candidate as a uh, state capitalist who's going to exploit the environment and to weaken international solidarity with Latin America. And he's backed by the U.S. His party has been backed by the U.S. government. It just doesn't get more naked. So Trained. I mean, that, trained yeah. by the U.S. government. Trained by the U.S. government. I, I just want to say Deborah really quick. Gaffer, like, and no, I just want to say really quickly, I think the main reason, honestly, that they, they published, I mean, they, wrote, they published that article for a few reasons, but the thing that pissed them off the most is in, this is a 6,000 word article. I mean, to Max's chagrin, you all know that I overwrite. I have way too much research in a lot of these well, pieces. Well, I'm the editor, so it's like, you know, am I going to like do anything with my day? Oh, sh I got a piece <laughs> yeah. of pen. I got Gareth Porter's like forensic breakdown of something like, you know. Well, but I think the main reason they wrote that letter is there's one line in this 6,000 word article, and that's what pissed them off the most. And it was this line. Today, I talk about how I document without a doubt. I mean, there's no, you cannot dispute these because these, these are facts. You cannot dispute them. So the fact that, that her work at this, her anti-Korea work in Ecuador was funded by Western governments, Taiwan. I mentioned Soros and you can never mention Soros in a bad way. Peace be on him because he's like a, a good billionaire. But, but anyway, that's what led them to speak me as an anti-Semite, which is insane. But anyway, the point is that the re I think the real reason they called me a sexist is because of this line. So keep in mind, this is someone who supported the Bolivia coup, who has been uh, supporting right-wing opposition forces in Ecuador. But today she is a professor of Latinx and Latin American studies at Amherst College in the United States and is the author of books with titles like Queering Narratives of Modernity, Sexualities in World Politics, and sex and tongue in international politics. That's what pissed them off. It's because they said I was sexist because I was pointing out, they said that that was, that was gendered and misogynist or whatever. But no, what I'm pointing out is that these are rad libs. These are intersectional imperialists. These are people who support racist colonialist coups yeah. backed by the United States and backed by the Trump administration while they talk this language about intersectionality and LGBT rights while they're supporting right-wing forces, objectively right-wing forces. I mean, it's it's the biggest farce. And it's just like Hillary Clinton saying that we can't break up the banks because it won't, it won't end racism. It reminds That's me of the paper, uh, which was the winner of the Enlo Award in 2014 by Cara Daggett. It's called Drone Disorientations, how quote-unquote unmanned weapons queer the experience of killing in war. And it's a defense of drones because they're unmanned and therefore queer. 
what if that's a self parody? Like they got in there and they decided to drop this. Like sometimes people do that in academia. They'll drop these fake papers to see if it it's gets real. Rejected. I mean, unless, <laughs> unless I'm like completely being, it's it's on, it's in the International Feminist Journal of Politics. That's hilarious. Volume 17, 2015. The first that's line, amazing. killing with drones produces queer moments of disorientation. Oh my God. Well, I, 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 I got to keep going. Drawing That's on amazing. queer phenomenology, I show how militarized masculinities function as spatio-temporal landmarks that give Korean <laughs> War its orientation and make it morally intelligible. <laughs> That's got to be a joke. That's got to be a joke. That's amazing. It has to be real. I mean, given the state of academia, I mean, oh honestly, you could take all of these institutions and all of the people in it and just like this, just like defund them completely and force them to like work frontline jobs, like being Uber Eats drivers. And we would lose nothing as a society. We would actually probably gain a lot as a society. Like, I know I sound anti-intellectual, but like these people can't even write. Like if I edited them, it would, I would just throw out their, I would never, they would never, I would never accept anything by them. Every word with them, it's like, they can't say colonial. It has to be a colonial, the coloniality. Like they just, Make up words they can't write basic language. They didn't learn their three R's. And Max is bodies and spaces. Max is yeah, Max, everything bodies is bodies and spaces and Foucaultian biopolitics. And it basically, and then their politics always they always resort to some kind of moral posturing that leads you into this neither nor dynamic when it comes to empire, where yeah. like the target of empire is equal because it's authoritarian or masculine. Uh, to or what whatever uh, uh, autocratic uh, state capitalist whatever it is that it's it's the it, it's it's something that we either have to oppose or support we can't just take that out of the equation and oppose the empire that you exist in the center of in an academic institution that is funded and created by these imperial elites you can't even recognize that so it's neither nor then they ultimately suppress any opposition and leave you with a character like Yaku Perez, who is the neither, who represents the empire. Like ultimately, they always wind up supporting the empire. I mean, a perfect example is like uh, the ultimate Radlib, Molly Crabapple, who you know just basically openly supports all of these military these military interventions, particularly in Syria and who is an Eric Schmidt fellow at the New America Foundation, a Democratic Party think tank funded by the State Department. Eric Schmidt is like the ultimate surveillance capitalist. He's the CEO of Google. And like this guy who has this phony, um, uh, like burning man for billionaires in the desert. So like, let, I, I just can't even like speak anymore when I think about these characters. Well, you know, it leads us put, to the other open letter, but I, yeah, I put Ben in the chat, uh, a tweet that is related to uh, what Max was talking about, because it reminds me uh, when Max and Anya and Rania went to Syria, there was like this freak out from people like Molly Crabapple and also Clar Clarissa Ward of she CNN. She called me a Nazi. She called me Goebbels. Yeah, Molly called you a Nazi. Uh, Clarissa Ward said that she was having uh, palpitations and spasms of rage because Max was reporting from the capital of a country that the U.S. has been destroying for the last decade with a dirty war. And Max was speaking to people who live under the control of their own government and who are living in the in in the territory where most Syrians live, and uh, I've never seen a case where journalists are targeted and elicit such a reaction just for the crime of visiting a country. Like we go to Venezuela, go to Ecuador, go to Nicaragua, go to Syria, and it's like that's a crime in itself. We can't even go there. We can't even. Well, talk they also to say people. they also say we're being paid by those governments to be there, like because they project their own mercenary tendencies. Exactly. Into, yes, exactly. Like that, they, exactly. They think that's how everyone must operate because that's how they operate. Yeah, yeah. I, I just yeah. want to point this out really quickly before we transition to Syria, because Max was talking about postmodern <laughs> philosophy and academics. There's a really good scholar. I mean, there are a few people left in academia who are good. I can count. I can count them in my hands. But one of them is is G Gabriel Rockhill, who's an excellent scholar, and he's done a lot of research actually on how the CIA 
and other Western governments were actually supporting the rise of these postmodern movements like Deleuze and Guattari, like Foucault, because they were ardent anti-communists. And he has this really huh. good piece, the CIA reads French theory on the an intellectual labor of demand, dismantling the cultural left. There's also a really good book, I mean, kind of the canonical book, The Cultural Cold War, which is very closely tied to all of that. But I think Syria is a, such a good example well, of wait, that. I, I want to jump in really quickly. I'm glad you brought that up, Deleuze and Guattari. I'm not saying that they are, you know, it, they they wrote this with the intention of having it used this way. But the Israeli army chief of staff, Aviv Kohavi, he was a student of Deleuze and Guattari. And he actually gave a series of presentations on how he he led the assault on Nablus and its old city during the end of the Second Intifada in Palestine. And if you've ever been to the old city, um, it's very there are these narrow alleys uh, and built up old buildings. And the Palestinian resistance was operating from there with the assumption that the Israelis would get caught in these alleys and they would be able to ambush them and overwhelm their um, operational military advantage. But Kohavi said that because he, he studied Deleuze and Guattari's war machine and he, he contrasted Palestinian society with its, its linear uh, old... Um, cultural backwardsness with the postmodern um, swarming, worm-like, a uh, nonlinear war machine, and what the Israeli military proceeded to do was to actually invade those homes, and avoid the alleys, and then smash through the living rooms of entire families with explosives and and sledgehammers to uh, root out the Palestinian resistance. And he chalked it up to postmodern philosophy, this strategy. So he's since been promoted to Israeli chief of staff. And this kind of, the, 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 this kind of postmodern thinking was projected to show the cultural superiority of Israel over the Palestinians through this figure who's essentially a war criminal. I had to read Deleuze and Guattari in college and I had no idea what they were talking about. So I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, I, most academics I just, don't I, either. I just they, remember they just thinking. Name drop them. I just remember thinking that my professor does not want to deal with real issues in the world. That that was my takeaway. I was like, so I just have to read this and pretend that it means something. But I, I, it's like what it had no connection at all to anything real, and it was just. Um, well, it ultimately means something much more elementary than, than we want to admit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is Foucault in biopolitics? It's like, some people can be rendered subhuman by the dominating force. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But it's a useful concept. Anyway. Um, and what's not we, often yeah. discussed is that at, toward the end of his life, I mean, he died very early in the rise of neoliberalism, but Foucault was very sympathetic to the rise of neoliberalism at the beginning because mm. his philosophy was so geared around individuals and individual liberty and all those things. So it's been useful. I mean, there's a reason that Foucault has, has just taken over the academy. I mean, this isn't also to mention, by the way, the recent revelations that a lot of people knew for a while that he had a predilection for y very young boys in Tunisia. And that was mm. very likely a pedophile. But I mean, mm. that's not surprising when we also know the history of French intellectuals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, he, Dominique Strauss-Kahn <laughs> found a lot of defenders among the French new philosophers who, they, I mean, they just look like a bunch of perverts. I mean, I mean, what's his name? Uh, like the guy who always BHL. has his shirt open? BHL. I mean, that guy just... Uh -oh. <laughs> this looks like a curve as he defends Israeli apartheid in like every regime change war. Um, and Saudi Arabia, Bernard Henri Levy is, is a friend of the Saudis. I guess got a friend of the Wojava. There he just is. Just because there Aaron is. mentioned, just because Aaron mentioned it, I got to show. Oh, there it is. Yes. There's that chest. It's I mean, true. Yes, he always has his, he always yes. has his, does he shave his chest or like, does he have it like waxed? Just what is that? Have you guys seen that picture where he's in Libya and he he stands up on his toes so that he looks even taller than the people he's posing <laughs> with? I swear to God, it's a real picture. He stands up on his feet so he can look taller than these like poor little Libyans who whose country he, he helped destroy. Well, he apparently so he can was, uh, expresses he was, colonial supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he played a s serious role there. I mean, he was kind of Hillary Clinton's, 
fixer. She, he introduced her to the kind of Libyan transitional council initially and got her on board and said, this is going to be another Rwanda unless the NATO intervened. That's it, and then, you know, in the end he was asked, um, you know, what, like years after Libya became a failed state, which was always the intention. I mean, it wasn't a failure of the U S this was actually a success, but you, you know, Libya became a failed state with, as Gaddafi predicted, open air slave auctions and a massive migration crisis. And they asked, <laughs> there he is. He's, 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 Look at him. he's he's against. Yeah. So he towers over the natives and, and, and it's Ooh, Kurdish leaders. Let me ask the chat because I, I saw somebody was complaining about Max's level. How How is everyone sounding? Can you put in the chat how the audio is and we can make adjustments accordingly? I hear everybody okay, but maybe it's yeah, different for yeah. the audience. I mean, I sound, if you, try to think of a better visual metaphor for European colonialism. This like this French blowhard who has never produced an intellectual thought in his life who, who just vomits out propaganda to manufacture consent for every Western war, standing on his toes to try to look taller than these opportunistic Kurdish leaders that already have been selling out their people anyway. I mean, it's just like, even even his own, like even Western puppets he doesn't respect. Yeah, is that Barzani's gang? Who is that? I'm not that's sure. a good question. I'm not sure, but they have they always have the, the woman Kurd that's become the sort of new fetishization of the liberal imperialists like Hillary Clinton or or Caroline Forrest, the editor of um, of uh, of uh, what's the the Islamophobic French magazine Charlie Hebdo. She also produced a, a film about the the Kurds, Kurdish women. Then you have uh, Hillary Clinton and I think Chelsea. They're producing a film about Kurdish female fighters, and uh, the Jacobin founders are producing a film about a uh, white gender fluid savior who goes to fight in Rojava, um, basically doing the work of the U.S. Marines fighting with the, you know, Kurdish autonomous fighters. So this is one of sort of the, the fetish of liberals and social Democrats in the U.S. And here's BHL right in the middle of it. Why? Because BHL, you know, he's at the end of the day, he's kind of an Israel lobbyist. And there's this longstanding relationship between Israel and the Kurds because the Kurds are one of these groups that aims to create an ethno state that fragments the Middle East and disrupts Arab nationalism, which is a longstanding goal of the Israel it's, lobby. It's and Barzani's they, gang. And here yeah, you can Barzani's see gang. this is a okay, stock I was wrong. photo. I said Libya, so obviously that's a mistake. I have to correct myself. This is not Libya. This is Iraq. It might as I mean, that's yeah, I mean, amazing. Very, but look and, at and this, it, this, this is far away. His shirt, looks so much, his shirt looks so much worse from far away. But Ben, who is Barzani? I mean, go, go off. No, I mean, the, so there are, there's not just one Kurdish leadership. The Kurdish community is split across four countries. And Barzani of all of the Kurdish leadership in, in Iraq is by far the most opportunistic, openly supported the Iraq war, openly collaborates with Israel. I mean, it's, it, it's so pitiful. I mean, and again, just like the fact that it's incredible that in this photo they also cut off his his feet, so you can't see that he's on, he's on his tiptoes. So he actually does look inhumanly tall. <laughs> and 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 you know, BHL, he's he's such a like a good example of how awful so much of that '60s generation that sold out is, mm -hmm. like the new French intellectual Alain, Alain Finkelkraut. You know, he became this fire breathing racist, but they were all Trotskyists in the sixties and they became disoriented, disillusioned by 1968. And then they began to believe that, um, the established defending the establishment was the only way forward. I think, you know, they provide a basis for understanding a lot of the academics that signed the letter attacking you, Ben, or signed the Syria letter who kind of, they start out radical or they want to present radical, but ultimately they defend the establishment, reap the benefits and the French new philosophers, I mean, they're just flaunting it. Uh, and they rem remind me a lot of the U.S. neoconservatives who used to be Trotskyists in the early 60s and late 70s, then turned on a dime either because of Israel or because of their belief that the Russian Jews had to be liberated. And then they constructed this false binary of democracy versus totalitarianism in which the Western world had to intervene to, to to fight this 
civilizational battle. And I think, you know, I can see so many people who go through this process, uh, starting out radical in, in our own, in, in my generation. And even in the, even in the millennial generation, you can kind of see this trajectory because I mean, how are you going to make a career otherwise? Okay, we're going to take a pause there. This is one part of our live stream discussion with our friend and colleague Aaron Mate. Definitely check out the other parts on the Cold War on China and the brutal war on the people of Syria, the Western sanctions that have devastated the economy and the society in Syria. If you want to support this work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And as always, thanks for listening or watching. Thank you.